What's up guys, Lucky Locks here. Welcome back to another prediction video. This is going to be for LFA 138. We have Ari Farias and Michinori Tanaka in the main event. Should be a good fight. A couple of good scraps on this one. And without further ado, let's get right into the first fight on the main card. First fight, we have uh, what should be a really fun fight between Motaz Oscar and Chris Makate. It's going to be at a catch weight of 150 pounds. Uh, Motaz Oscar, 7-0 amateur, 3-0 pro, representing Factory X. He has two round one finishes as a pro. Uh, this is going to not be the first time he's fighting at 150 pounds catch weight. You know, he's fought at 145, 150, 155. Uh, you know, he's done it all in that... Uh, in that region of, uh, of the weight classes, you know, featherweight, lightweight, and in between. So he's a well-rounded guy. He's a good striker. He's a good grappler as well. Uh, seems to be a pretty promising prospect. He's fighting against Chris Makate here, who was a former college wrestler at Old Dominion. And he employs that wrestling very well in his fights. He lost his LFA debut. He came in as a 1-0 pro. Uh, lost to Alberto Rodriguez. And for all the MMA mathematicians out here, uh, you might appreciate this one. That one lost to Alberto Rodriguez. Oscar does have a win over him, so uh, that's interesting to note, common opponent there. Uh, Makate has since, though, rattled off three straight wins in the meantime. He has a 75% finish rate. He's been training with guys like Dan Argetta, Cub Swanson, Juan Archuleta. So, you know, he's been working with good guys. And Motaz, for sure, is working with good guys at Factory X2. Um, I agree with Oscar being the favorite. He has a striking advantage, for sure. Uh, Oscar is a pretty good wrestler as well, but I am going to give Makate the edge there. If this fight plays out on the feet. I think it's going to be Motaz all day. But I think that Makate is going to come going to come prepared with a good game plan. I think that, you know, he got too comfortable fighting on the feet last time out against Alberto Rodriguez and it got him caught. He mentioned in an interview after the fact that, you know, he realized he's got to play his game and not get sucked into that type of a thing. So he's currently sitting at plus 150 and I think that's about right on Chris Makate here. I mean, if you got it earlier, I think that that was a pretty good bet. I mean, if you got it like plus 240, I don't think it should have been that wide. I think you got some good value there, but I feel like a lot of that value has been extracted from the line now. Um, I feel like the line is... Uh, it's pretty accurate on this fight. I mean, if you were forced to bet it, I would probably go the Makate side just because you're getting plus money there. And, you know, we haven't seen too, too much out of either guy, really, uh, thus far. So if you're going to give me dog money on one of the guys, I guess I would go there. Um, I'm not interested in, in, in betting either of these guys at this spot, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, I think if you got in on those those early numbers on Makate, you got a pretty good bet there. But now um, I probably wouldn't touch this line now on either side. Next up, we have a featherweight bout between Jota Ninomiya and Nick Talavera. Uh, Ninomiya, first of three featherweight fights coming up on this card here, is going to be this one. And he's coming in with a, a karate-type background. He's a very good striker, very powerful, and very precise as well. Um, I like what I've seen out of him so far in the striking realm. Uh, he is 1-0 as a pro, scored a 30-second knockout on LFA 133 in June. Uh, had a good amateur run before that. He was 4-2 as an amateur, but one of those losses was a disqualification for an illegal knee. Uh, I didn't watch the fight, so I'm not exactly sure what happened there. But, uh, you know, we'll take that loss with a grain of salt there. So he won four straight amateur fights, though, before turning pro, all on LFA. Uh, three of them coming inside the distance. And he's coming up against Nick Talavera here, who is a 2-1 fighter. Uh, was... You know, an experienced amateur guy, 6-5, and five, not the greatest record, but did get a lot of experience under his belt as an amateur fighter. Um, as a pro so far in his three fights, he's fought all debutantes, so all 0-0 guys. Uh, he finished two of them, and then his loss, he lost via decision. So at 6 foot, you know, in featherweight division, he's got really good size. Uh, he's also a pretty good grappler, but I think that Ninomiya is going to take this one. You know, at, at minus 600, this isn't really a hot take. Um, I think he's going to be able to keep his distance and land his shots here. So am I lining up to bet minus 600? No, but do I think he's going to get the win? Uh, yes, I do. Next up, we have another featherweight bout between AJ Cunningham and Shea Conley. Cunningham, so the first time I saw him fight live was uh, was last March in his LFA debut, and there was a decent amount of buzz around him. He had a 12-3 and amateur run, and he was a 7-1 and professional coming into that match against Javier Garcia, and you know he dropped the decision there as a big favorite, and that was kind of the fight that put me on to Javier Garcia, you know, um, looking at the guy a little bit differently, and, and you know, he's been good for the most part uh, since that fight, and Cunningham since then has uh, has collected himself and he's getting back in there. He was scheduled to fight Fred Freeman on LFA, not the LA Dodgers first baseman, uh, completely different guy. And that one was right after the Javier Garcia fight and kind of seemed like a bit of a law, but that ended up falling through. So he ends up in the cage against a decent guy in Jonathan Jackson that came on Attitude MMA and he won a split decision there. So not super convincing, but he did get the job done, got back in the win column. Uh, and now he's back in the LFA for this fight. He's got good size for 
striker or featherweight. He's a good striker as well. Footwork is good. Movement is good. Uh, coming in against Shay Conley here, who is a 6-4 and four fighter, and he had a real rough start to his pro career, right? So he's 2-4 and four in his first six fights. Had to fight some serious prospects, you know, during that span. I mean, he was submitted by AJ Nichols. Lost to an Ono Gage Young, who's now 5-0. and oh. Lost to an Ono Marshall Kemp, who's now 5-1, and one, training at Glory MMA and Fitness. Um, and Conley's coming into this fight on a four-fight win streak now. He won four straight uh, after that kind of a rocky start. And uh, he finished all of them. Three of those finishes were in the first round, one of them in the second round. So he's looked very good in the meantime, right? Three wins in under 40 seconds. One of them came in in uh, 14 seconds. And the level of competition, you know, very low. Uh, I will say that much, but he is doing what he's supposed to do, right? He's getting those guys out of there, but but low level of competition. And against good fighters, he he you know he hasn't looked all that great. Um, against the lower level, he looks very good, right? So he's dangerous early, and to me, it feels like a lot of his win equity is going to be pretty front loaded in this spot. Um, I think that if this fight gets out of the first two and a half minutes, though, I think Cunningham's going to start to take over. But you know, Conley's going to come out flying, and and I really wouldn't be too surprised to see him pull off an early upset. Um, so. I mean, yeah, I, I think Cunningham wins this fight. Is this a guy that I trust and, and that I want to back at a minus 400 price tag? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, you're not going to catch me at the window betting this guy, but I do think that uh, he's going to get the win on Friday night. All right, now in the third straight featherweight fight in a row, here we have Elijah Johns versus Masuto Kawana. So Johns, 8-2, and 2, Fortis MMA product. He is the brother of Miles Johns, and he's going to be in his ninth LFA fight here. So... He has been with the promotion for a long time. You know, if you watch LFA, you've watched Elijah Johns a ton of times, right? Uh, he's 6-2 and two with the promotion in the eight fights that he's already had in the LFA. And he won his last fight and had a, you know, had a really good performance. But he missed weight by a wide margin for that fight against Brandon Phillips. So, and, you know, he, he employed really a, a wrestling-heavy game plan. So, you know, I mean, I, I hope you're going to be able to keep top control when you have uh, a weight advantage coming in, right? But nevertheless, you know, he minded his P's and Q's. He did what he was supposed to do, and he got a win, and he did it convincingly. So uh, he did miss weight, but we're not going to knock him too hard for that. Um, Elijah Johns is a good wrestler. Uh, the stand-up is serviceable as well. He's got some decent power. Um, doesn't finish guys a ton of the time. You know, he, he goes to decision quite a bit, but uh, he does have some decent power in his hands and, you know, decent, decent kind of boxing basics. Coming up against Kawana here, uh, Kawana is going to be fighting, this is going to be his fourth fight this year, so he has been very active in 2022. He is a 5-1 wrestler from Japan. I want to say like he won the under-23 championships, something like that. Um, he's a very accredited wrestler. Uh, he is out of the Greco-Roman style, however, which you know I've explained this on videos in the past. The difference between freestyle and Greco-Roman, uh, well, the basic difference, right? I'm not a wrestler myself, but the basic difference is that you can't touch the lower body in Greco-Roman, so you're working a lot from the body lock, um, and that's where, you know, he kind of likes to get his takedowns, looks to get it from the body lock. Uh, most Greco-Roman guys, when they come to MMA, are looking for that type of a takedown uh, just because that's what they've been working for a long time before transitioning into mixed martial arts. Um, he fought an experienced guy in Derek Yamamoto last time out. Other than that, nothing really noteworthy about the level of competition that he faced. Um, I don't know if this is a great matchup for him here in his LFA debut. He's fighting a guy in Elijah Johns who... You know, already has eight LFA fights under his belt, training at a top gym in Fortis MMA. Um, and Elijah Johns is a guy who's kind of been flirting with the next level for a while now, kind of just on the cusp. Um, Kawana is going to be making his U.S. debut here, his LFA debut. Uh, his also his first really big step up in competition, in my opinion. And, you know, I think with Johns also being a good wrestler, this isn't a great matchup for Kawana. I don't see him really being able to hold Johns down for three rounds. Um, and I don't see him having the upper hand on the feet either. I'd be... You know, I'd be a little surprised to see Johns drop this one, to be honest, but there's still a lot for us to learn about Kawana, and he could really come in and, and, and surprise people here. So is this a spot where I want to lay, you know, minus 280, minus 290, minus 300 on Elijah Johns? No, um, not really. I do think he wins, but uh, I'm really not interested in uh, in backing him here. And, uh, you know, just I'm going to use this as a fight kind of to collect information, uh, see what these guys looks like, mainly with uh, Kawana. He's kind of the more of the unknown. I feel like we kind of know what we're getting uh, out of Elijah Johns, and what we're getting is, uh, you know, a high-level regional guy, and I think this is a big step up for Kiwana, so, you know, I'm not ready to uh, to back him as the dog here, but I'm also not ready to uh, to lay any money on Elijah Johns as the favorite, but, you know, just pure prediction-wise, I'm going to lean towards Elijah Johns in this fight. All right, Coleman event up next. This should be a really good fight. I'm really looking forward to watching this one for sure. We have Oscar Oscar versus Diego Silva at Bantamweight, so... 
Oscar is a 13-2 fighter. He is coming in on a two-fight win streak. His first loss came in 2020 against now UFC fighter Saeed Yakub Kakramanov. He got knocked out in 40 seconds there. I mean, the way that he lost is a little concerning, but I mean, losing to Saeed Yakub Kakramanov is... Uh, is not bad in the slightest. I mean, that's a guy that I'm high on. I think he's a very good fighter, and I think that the best is still yet to come from him as well. So, um, yeah, I, I don't really hold that loss against Oscar at all. He then followed that up with a good win over Kevin Worth on LFA. And, you know, the UFC obviously liked what they saw there because he got the call to fight Cody Stamen in the UFC, but he unfortunately was not medically cleared to fight. He returned to the regional scene four months later and was finished by Justin Wetzel on LFA, uh, then won a split decision over Leandro Gomez, then a unanimous decision over Royce Gobek Ibrahimov. Uh, so two good wins for him there. Oscar, he's a good striker. He's a good grappler. He's a well-rounded guy, uh, similar to his brother in that regard that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, Oscar is a good prospect, but I will say he has lost a little bit of his hype. I think that big physical guys with finishing upside, you know, just aggressive physical guys can give him problems in there. You know, guys like a Justin Wetzel, guys like a Saeed Yuku Kakramanov, um, that type of a fighter can give him trouble. And Diego Silva is coming in here with a 14-7 and record. I feel like that's a little bit misleading. Uh, I think he's a lot better than that record looks. Uh, he fought some really tough guys over in Russia early in his career, uh, guys like Hussein Shekhaev. He fought Russell Doan right after his UFC career ended. Um, he's fought Jay Perrin, who's in the UFC now, and his most recent loss came in his last fight. It was a split decision loss against Dan Argetta, and after that fight, Dan Argetta got the call to the UFC, so you really can't hold that one against him either. I thought he looked pretty decent against Dan Argetta as well. Um, the fight before that one, Silva fought Andre Sukumta, you know, former UFC fighter, and that was, came in CES, and he dominated that fight um i was very impressed with that performance and uh you know definitely made me consider him against dan argetta i did end up did end up going with dan argetta in that one who got the win but you know i knew that was going to be a tight one because diego silva for sure is no joke and uh, he's 28 years old right now right in that prime window very game fighter very aggressive and he's got skills everywhere he can strike he can grapple um you know i, I really like what i've seen out of diego silva and Oscar Oscar opened up as the minus 300 favorite in this fight and has moved all the way to a plus 125 dog. And uh, it's a very, very big line movement there. And I agree with it. Silva now at minus 155. I still think that's a pretty decent number on Silva. I mean, if you were able to get Silva at like plus 240 or whatever he opened at, I think that's an absolutely fantastic bet. Probably the best bet on the card, in my opinion, if you were able to get that number. Um, I like Silva to win here. Uh, I think he's the type of fighter that can give a guy like Oscar some big problems. Oscar also is no joke. You know, this is a high-level fight, man. Um, there's a reason this is in the position that it is on the card. This should be a good fight, but i got to go with uh, Diego Silva to get the win in this one. Main event time, we have a banger at Bantamweight once again between Ari Farias and Michinori Tanaka. Uh, Ari Farias, 18-3 and Brazilian prospect. Uh, amazing jiu-jitsu player turned MMA fighter. Has very good experience. Uh... In both the jiu-jitsu world and the MMA world, he had two fights in ACB back in the day, defeated Simon Oliveira, who went on to earn a UFC contract on Dana White's Contender Series, and that was actually the first time I had seen Simon Oliveira fight, and uh, that was a back-and-forth fight, a really good fight. I would recommend going and watch that. Uh, if you're interested, it is an entertaining bout on YouTube. Made his LFA debut after that fight, and... Picked up a really nice submission win over uh, a very game opponent in Devante Sewell that we saw very recently on LFA. Uh, you know, kind of a staple of the regional scene. Good fighter. And, you know, if you're able to get past him, that shows that you're definitely uh, you're ready for another test. And he also defeated another really tough guy in Johnny Campbell that we've seen on Bellator. And uh, that fight ended in less than 30 seconds after an ear injury, however. So, you know, we really don't know how that one uh, would have played out had it continued. But nevertheless, it's a good name on the resume for Ari Farias. And we saw him the next year after that on LFA 111 in Brazil. Um, I picked him to win, actually bet him to win in that fight, and he got melted early by Marcus Breno, who hit him with a perfect shot. Um, we're, and Breno has a fight coming up as well. I want to say maybe on PFL, actually, he's fighting soon. Um, but nevertheless, Ari Farias does have some good experience there. And, uh, you know, he lost that fight in LFA, but got back into the win column in his next fight. And now he's back in the LFA octagon on Friday night. Uh, Tanaka is going to be on the other side of the cage. Michinori Tanaka, UFC veteran. He broke into the UFC in 2014 with a 9-0 record and won his debut. But then lost his next fight to a, you know, a UFC mainstay fighter in Kyung Ho Kang, who is still with the organization and, and still winning fights in the big show. So that has not aged too poorly 
poorly at all. Tanaka was also able to defeat Joe Soto, who was good enough to stick around for another five fights in the UFC after that. Um, but then Tanaka drops two straight, one to Ronnie Yaya, one to Hikaru Hamosh. Uh, you know, both those guys also, um, to my knowledge, still with the organization. Found himself out of the UFC after that, and then chokes out Rogerio Bontarin later that year on the regionals. Uh, another very high-level win, right? So he's in there with really good guys and, and giving good accounts of himself. Um, that win aged very well because Bontarin went on to the UFC and went on to have... Um, you know, a lot of high-level fights after that. So after that, we don't see Tanaka for uh, for over a year. Then comes back and wins a fight on Pancrase. Nine months later, he makes his LFA debut um, against a very seasoned guy in Ricardo Diaz and uh, and put on a very impressive performance there. You know, won that fight very convincingly. Um, and, you know, he showed that he still got it. He's still hungry. He's getting back in the cage here. Um, I think that Tanaka is the more well-rounded fighter here with the better experience and, and also with the better skill set. I mean... The grappling, obviously, uh, Ari Farias in terms of the BJJ is going to be the better fighter, but I do think that Tanaka, you know, with his own grappling, is is going to have enough to kind of neutralize that submission game, and I think that he's going to be the better fighter uh, in other areas, just more more experience in these high level situations. Uh, although Farias does have also does have some very good names on his resume, I think this is a great fight, high level fight between two high level guys. Um, I'm hoping we're going to get some really fun scrambles in this one, and. Uh, you know, minus 200 or, or above, I'm not super interested in Tanaka anymore, but I do think he deserves to be the favorite, and uh, I do think he's going to win this one. Uh, could be a close fight, but I'm going to lean with Tanaka here. Uh, should be a really fun one. So that's going to do it for my LFA 138 predictions, guys. Thank you very much for watching, as always. Uh, best of luck this weekend, and I will catch you on the next video.